The following interview was conducted with Jill May, Professor of Literacy and Language in the School of Education for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, February 16, 2011, Stewart Center. This is part two of the interview. Welcome. Good afternoon, Thank Professor you. May. Thanks. We'll pick up, we'll talk about the book that you published on that, Exploring Culture and Diverse Literature for Children and Adolescents. Okay. That was the book I published, uh, co-edited uh, co with Darwin Henderson, and Darwin was on the faculty for a while. He went, he came here from the University of Cincinnati, and he actually went back to the University of Cincinnati. He was in the program of early childhood education, and I had known him for several years. And to be quite candid, the then department head told me that I could get another faculty member in children's literature if I could find someone who would bring diversity to the campus. And Darwin was African American and he was a very dear friend. So we wrote this book after he left Purdue and went back to Cincinnati. It gave him a reason to come back and forth and stay with the family. We both believed that people were talking about multiculturalism all the time. And it seemed to us that it was identifying that there were more than there were diverse groups of people in the United States, but that it had very little to do with how our social and literary patterns develop into our literature. And so we wanted to get a book that talked about the differences between Latin American literature, Latino-Latina uh, literature, and Native American literature, African American literature, women's literature. So what we did was we invited several friends to write a chapter. and. Um, we told them to write it within their own voice. So a lot of them are very personal. They tell you the book, uh, the chapter on religion, for instance, is by a woman named Barbara Lehman, and she talks about her own background, uh, which is um, Amish, and, and um, she talks about books that have been written with Amish characters and uh, how reading it as an insider makes her look at the books as opposed to if she were not. Um, so it was a fun book, and, and we had a lot of fun. It took us over five years to edit it and get it together, and, um, and we wrote the introductions together, and um, it was really fun. What, what were some of the other highlights I mean, you know, that you got from that? I mean, from the, the literature for the particular groups. There was a, it, it, I, we got a lot of highlights. Um, a friend of, of Darwin's and mine, Violet Harris, who was in Ch well, she was the head of, of education for a while at um, University of Illinois, wrote a chapter on new books that had come out, The Cheetah Girls, and they were books on uh, diverse families, uh, African-American connections often, but also Italian and other connections. And it was very interesting because she actually said that those books, um, she indirectly said those books stereotyped also, and that though they had been written by an African-American, she also stereotyped uh, using color stereotypes and using other stereotypes. And it's also interesting that my students, when they would read the, the chapter, would usually think that she was talking positively about the Cheetah Girls. And then I would have to say, you have to read under the text. You have to see that she's saying that uh, the characters who are true African-Americans are darker in color and they're never sure about their prettiness or their popularity. And so there were some interesting connections that I learned, but also in trying to get our students to think in other ways, right, you know, not yeah. just read at the surface. All right. Get the, the, the full impact. The right, impact exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Understand what they were reading. Right. Yeah. Now you got, you were the Robert L. Snodgrass Scholar, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you wrote a research designing a model curriculum of literature for the elementary school. Right. Well, actually I was a Snodgrass uh, scholar and Bob Kane, who was then the head of the department, let me do it for two years instead of one year. I went. Where was the funding coming from? The school. It, it, a man named Snodgrass, who I think was on the faculty long before I came, uh, gave this money to Purdue, and it was my understanding that he actually gave it to make sure that there would be money for scholars who might be past that beginning stage. You know, when you get your first sabbatical or leave, or, or you can get now you can get in the humanistic center and. Um, perhaps not, though, because when uh, Dean Herring came along, Marilyn Herring, she took that money back and used it in other ways. So, but I think, actually, the Snodgrass was a wonderful thing because it gave me that time to work on developing a curriculum. And I was working on a K-6 curriculum. I had worked with the Children's Literature Association, set together, uh, put together a workshop for them once before their conference on 
what would a literary criticism program look like? And then I actually went to West Lafayette uh, to the superintendent and asked if we could do a model program. And the, uh, prin the superintendent at the time said, oh, we have reading and writing. We don't need anything else. And so I walked out and thought, no, they need a formal program that they could pick up that would be in books. And I worked on the program and um, actually designed what it would look like. And I did work with one of the uh, parochial schools in town, and we did do it. And the principal took me to a, a regional conference the next year, and um, he said, it, it was the Lafayette Christian School, and he said, Jill, you know, our students' test scores never went up in reading. And I said, never promised they would. <laughs> There's a difference between reading literature and understanding what you're reading and passing a reading test, and that was what I was trying to get people to understand. But out of that came the need, I thought, and Darwin did too, to develop a book that at least students, when they were in the college level, would begin to understand the difference in different texts. And so the Snodgrass never became really a program that I published. It became uh, the germ that allowed me to then work with Darwin on this book. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Okay. The Westonwood Scholarship? Uh, was reassessing the impact of the Disney Touch. Now that's an interesting. Right. Now I first met Mort Schindel, who was the founder of Weston Woods, when I was a young uh, faculty member in the library program that they had here. And I was going to write a book on Mort Schindel. That was my idea. But I was going to write a book on Weston Woods. And I actually wanted to write a book that talked about uh, its uses in the schools and, yes, and how he devised the programming that he did. And yes, I wanted to talk about more, but not um, make him the center of the uh, program. That never came to fruition because Mort really didn't want any critical analysis of what he had done. Uh, he was a wonderful man, but he called me up after reading the first chapter and said, Jill, my children have asked that you send everything to me and I okay it. And that isn't the way academia works. So I said, OK, I'll do that. And um, then I just quit the project. But um, he had given me then money. He, he still stuck behind me. And he had given me money to look at the difference between the Disney products and the kinds of things that he had produced. And I published a few articles out of that uh, talking about what's the difference between what we do for um, with literature when we want the literature to stay alive and what Disney did to popularize it and use popular culture to make it work. And so I did that. And years later, Mort actually gave me another grant uh, that I never brought to fruition. So you're just going to find out I didn't bring much to fruition. <laughs> and, but it was to study. Uh, by now, he had a home that he went to in Florida during the winter. And my daughter ended up working at the Sarasota uh, theater there, and so I went down to Sarasota, saw Mort and saw my daughter, and they had a wonderful program that I wish, Katie, every place had. The, um, the theater program brought in teachers, and they would show them adaptations of a particular uh, play that they were going to show, and they would train them to be able to see the differences in the different productions and understand it, and then they would bring in the woman who actually found all of these things, and then they would design some kind of program for the kids. And so the, uh, uh, Mort had worked with Robert McCloskey, and they had written, uh, somebody had written an adaptation of the, the donuts and, uh, and uh, of that Homer Price book. And so um, I was interviewing the teachers in elementary school and the teachers in high school and the kids to see how they use this. The reason I quit working on the project is Sarasota closed the program down. And you can't really get anyone to publish about a new and innovative program when it's gone. But it's a program that should have lasted. One of the high school kids was going out on his interviews. I remember this so much. I'm, they all said it did him a lot of good. But I asked this kid, if you go to a college and there's a, a play on, do you go see it? And he said, oh, yes, but I would never have done it before this program. But now, yes, I'm going to go to all the right, plays yeah. at college. So. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting what they come out of it. Uh, Lilia Sam with some of the elementary school teachers. I've, I, I've always wanted, uh, well, for a long time I worked with a lot of different teachers, and sure. I've always wanted teachers to be able to 
select books that they think fit their curriculum and fit their classroom and maybe have classroom sets. I would prefer they had classroom sets so that all the kids are reading the same book at the same time. And also begin to talk to the students about characterization, setting, plot, the kinds of things that you talk about when you're in high school that so many kids, when they get into that high school English class and the person says, write about the difference between the character who was the main character and the character who uh, was a flat character, they don't know what they're doing. And they have no idea because what they've done is they've done plays, they've done murals, they've done uh, letters to the author, but they have never talked about those elements that are in literary theory that begin to crop up in high school. So um, I did work with that one high school. I also worked with a group of teachers in West Lafayette, and we designed um, a program for their fourth and fifth and sixth grades. The principal was then Bob Forrester, and he told the teachers, and the librarian was working with me, and he told the teachers and myself and the librarian that he was going to hold a meeting for all the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade teachers. And unless they all agreed to do this program, we couldn't do it because they were getting new textbooks in reading and language arts. They would either be all textbook or all trade books. And I remember one of the teachers said to me, Jill, don't talk too much now. We'll just take care of this. <laughs> and we went into this meeting and... Uh, this is fourth grade from the, the school. Yeah, yeah so. fourth through sixth grade. Yeah. And um, we went into the meeting and uh, I explained that we had been taking the text and we'd been working on different literary patterns and trying to figure out where they fit and how the kids could understand them and what was going on. And we had picked books that went with the other curriculum, social studies, science, and math, so that it would all integrate. And this teacher was, he was a gym teacher, and he also taught in the sixth grade. And he looked at me and said, you're asking us to write curriculum. And I looked at him and said, yes, that's what you're trained to do. That's what you look, got your degree to do, to be a teacher who can evaluate and write curriculum. Well, that stopped them all. They didn't want to write their own curriculum. They wanted the, the textbooks because it was all written for them and all they had. So I walked out and the teachers said to me, one of them, well, you blew it. <laughs> but I had expected that teachers would understand that part of their profession was to be the evaluator of curriculum and to find appropriate materials. You know, when I was in library school, you learned the right book for the right child at the right time. And you learned that you were supposed to listen to children, see what their interests were and what their abilities were, and help them find the right book for the moment. One that they would appreciate and like so that next time they'd come back in and get another one. Um, that isn't always what we do in, in the schools, unfortunately. Oftentimes what we do is we get a curriculum and we say these are the guidelines, now we call them standards, but these are the standards that all students will meet at the end of the year. Well, not all students will meet the same standards at the end of the year. And so what we're doing is we're assuming that there's a one road path for every single child in that room. And at the same time, we're not teaching them to be critical thinkers because if you're a critical thinker, you have to pause and ask the question, why was that happening? Mm -hmm. Who did that? How does that affect me? And um, oftentimes that doesn't happen. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, committees, one of them was the University Library Committee. How long did you serve on that? I served two terms on the University Library when, Committee. Uh, Emily was the dean. When Emily was the dean, Emily Mobley. And uh, I was the chair of the Library Committee the second time. Okay. So I got to be in on your promotion and tenure meetings. And a little quick aside uh, secret story is that one year I was really glad I was on that because both committees were meeting at the same time, both the education and the library. So I asked Emily if she could push hers back, oh, 45 minutes because the dean wanted me to come to the other one. And she said yes. And uh, 45 minutes was not enough for the School of Education, the College of Education, to talk about the candidate I didn't want to talk about because I didn't want to have to vote. This candidate was a candidate who was going up for full professor and I wasn't sure they should, but I didn't really want to voice my opinion and I really didn't want to get involved, so luckily I had to go to Emily's meeting and, I, and go to it. And yes, and I, I, uh, there were lots of things happening at that time. That was when Emily was, was asked by um, Provost Ringel to give back 
lots of money from the periodicals. And so it was a reformation of what yeah, was going right. on. Yeah. And uh, I admired her a lot because um, it was a difficult time. Faculty like their periodicals, and they like the ones they have. Yeah. And um, as, you, as we both know, the science periodicals are so extremely expensive. But in order to um, make it equitable, every school had to cut the same kind of percentage-wise. Well, in a school like liberal arts or education, that can mean a major cut in some of your journals. In science, often the journal is two or three times on campus. And so in many ways, the new electronic system of journals is better for all of us. It equals it. It equalizes it, 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 it out. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, it Tell teachers encouraging a love for literature. Teachers encouraging a love for literature came out of. Um, Is this a local? It was a local. Well, oh. actually, it was statewide. Oh. After a while, but what happened was Lee Forrester, Bob Forrester's wife, who had gone through the library program, and actually, I'd had both Bob and Lee. Uh, I had Bob in my class, and Lee. I taught a few times when she was uh, in the children's literature class, so I knew them for years, and. Um, Lee was putting together a program. She was very active in the American Library Association, especially in the school part. And she had seen a program that was on tape, Jump Over the Moon, that was, I think, in South Carolina. I can't remember for sure. But um, the, the Jump Over the Tape book is in my, in my collection of books. But anyway, because they had a couple of my articles in it. Um, and so she called up that company, and they told her they wouldn't sell it to her. The, the, what, the, book? the program. She oh, wanted to program. use it in the summer and teach all of her librarians and all of her okay. teachers who wanted to how to use literature. Um, because I was in town and she should be coming to me and I should be putting a program together. So she went to Dudley Heron, who was then my boss. He was an, uh, in charge of uh, uh, our program, the curriculum and instruction. And he came back to me and asked me if I would put together a program. So. We had a summer school program, pre-technology, where they wrote to me all the time, and it came via courier from all the schools. And some of them were in uh, suburbs of, like, Zionsville, so they would <laughs> send it in regular mail, you know. And then I promised them I would write an answer to every single one of them. And I also was in my office for phone conferencing. And then the rest of it was on public television, through the uh, public television station in Indianapolis. And most of it was the jump over the moon videos because they would let us have the videos and the ones I selected. But we made at least three videos where I interviewed Lee and other teachers or teachers in the field. And um, out of that, and those are in the archives now, I think, and out of that evolved Tell, Teachers Encouraging a uh, Love for Literature. At the end of the summer, Lee said, if you could do anything you wanted, Joe, what would you do? And I said, I'd get teachers together regularly and make them talk about literature together and make them share the same pieces and come back and see the diverse ways they were sharing it. She got a grant from the uh, Indiana Department of Education, and we put that program together. And the first year, teachers did meet. They made a commitment to meet, I think, every other week. And we met after school at the Lafayette uh, Corporation's uh, headquarters. And they had to come with a lesson plan. We, uh, in turn, we gave them all the books for free. And they had to then present to each other. And then after that, we be designed a program. And I think we got another grant from um, the Department of Education. And we brought in the editor of children's books for, from ALA, uh, from book list and um, we brought in speak, uh, speakers I knew, people I knew and she knew too. And then it evolved into a program that um, actually no longer met after school because a lot of the teachers said they couldn't do that, but met oh, three or four times a year and maybe a little bit more than that on Saturdays and it would be a half day and we would bring in an author or an illustrator and they would give a presentation to the teachers. And in addition to that, the way we made the money to get them is that schools would buy to have them for two hours. And so they would come the day before, and they would do a circuit of the schools. And we had lots of diversity 
It was really exciting because we brought in Tom Feelings, um, and uh, he talked about his books on slavery and on his doing um, the kinds of things that he did. We brought in um, two young Japanese and Korean uh, who were then now American artists, and uh, one of them did a book called Baseball Saved Me, Saved Us, and um, so we were able to bring in diverse populations, or diverse authors and uh, storytellers. And that stayed together for a long time, um, and I was on the board of directors for that for a long time, and I was very active for a long time. Um, but I actually knew that the group might have problems because um, because Lee actually took on the leadership role to the point that uh, she was still on the board, but she was getting all the speakers, and she was bringing them in and housing them in her house. And so one of the last board meetings I went to, having been on other national boards and international boards, I said we need insurance because we're bringing people into town. If they should have an accident, uh, we're responsible for them, and we could be sued. So we should have insurance and we also have to have a yearly meeting where we present our books and they're audited by members of the organization and we need to get a tax-free status. We need to be uh, an organization that is a, a nonprofit, And we need to have Lee as an executive director but not as a board member because she is doing all the things executive directors do but she also shouldn't have a vote you should, as a group, be deciding who you want her to bring in, but without that, sh you have no recourse, and, and she has no recourse. And for one reason or the other, the board didn't want to do that. And at that point, I just thought, well, I'll pull back a little bit. Um, there are too many chancy things going on here. And sure enough, Lee became a grandmother, and she lost interest and tell folded. So... How many years did it run? Oh, it ran... 10, 15? I'd say 10 or 15 years, oh, yeah. Really? It ran a long time. So that I see teachers out now, and they'll say to me, oh, weren't those the good days? Remember right. when you, Steph... Uh, I remember one time they stopped. You, you brought a speaker that came late afternoon or something into the archives. I remember that, that and you that, wanted to show that. Right, right and, and that could have been part of that program. Yeah, yeah and the yeah. program was the next day. Yeah. They came late afternoon or something. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Um, College of Education had a couple of deans. When you were here, who was the, was Bob, who was Actually, the when I came here, I was thinking about that today. There was a department head, and I don't remember who it was. The first department, because I was part-time, and but the first department head I remember was Albo, and I remember him only because he, Ringel, fired him in the middle of the semester, he and would. he fired him. He got rid of him. Well, actually, what he did was, he demoted him out of the classes and out of the, out of the department head and put him in the basement of this building and put him in, he was in special ed and put him in a special place and then hired a new department head. And that's when Bob Kane became a department head. And I, uh, Bob Kane was very good to me. He basically let me know that he would keep me as long as I kept doing things, producing things. And he was our first dean. And so I have a very fond place in my heart for Bob Kane. And I really admired Bob Kane because he would call you in. I was a member of the film studies program at Purdue. And he called me in and said they've been asked for, I don't know, $600. Not a lot of money, but I think it was a token asking that Ringo was doing to see how many of the programs really, really wanted this program. And he asked me, I, and I had been, they had a conference here every year, and I had been the person choosing the, the children's and young adult film studies sessions. And he asked me why we should have a film studies program and, I, and I be connected to it. And I said, because our course is called Media for Children, and we talk about films and, and other media. Um, and he, at the end of the time, said, thank you, Jill, for sharing. Now I have to think about this. And about a week later, I got the letter saying to Ringel that he would not give the money and that the College of Edu or that the department was pulling out of that program. Um, but I admired him for that because he let you tell him how you felt about something and then he, he needed some, uh, made his feedback. own decisions based on things he knew that I didn't know. You know, he didn't have to share that. So I, I always liked Bob. I thought he was extremely ethical and a wonderful person. Um, but he didn't, he had a, uh, health problems his last year uh, before he, the first year when he was a 
dean of the college, it was a school then, he knew he was going to not be the dean much longer, and then they had a search and Marilyn Herring came. And um, Marilyn Herring was good and bad for Purdue. Um, she actually, um, in one way or the other, got rid of a lot of the el older faculty, which um, you want to do as a dean, but on the other hand, they were her published scholars and her people uh, with reputations. And um, she replaced them um, with people who were more interested in teaching than in scholarship. And so that changed the venue of the College of Education. It was school then. Mm -hmm. It changed it from uh, having people like Jim Barth, who had, mm, I don't know, eight, nine, ten Fulbrights and traveled all over the Middle East and Africa, helping them put together social studies programs, to having an Ackerman Center here, which is good, but uh, then is now focused on technology in the schools. And so it changed the focus. Yeah. And whether that's good or bad, there are good and bad parts sure. to every change. And after Marilyn, we had... George Hine. George Hine. And George Hine was the smartest man I ever met. He came in, not really, but I mean, he was quite smart. He came from Georgia. Yes, he came from Georgia. And he came in and he actually told the faculty what he wanted to do. And he wanted us to bring in major grants and he wanted us to move the school forward. But it didn't take him long to realize that this faculty that had been hired was now teacher-oriented and not grant-oriented. And that though he had brought in some new young faculty, as all deans do, who were interested in writing grants, they really had no understanding on how to do it because they were assistants and associates. Sure. And so, uh, my read is that he decided that the smartest thing for him to do would be to ally himself with Beering and um, to change the focus of education yet again. And that's when we changed to a focus of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's when we hired a lot of faculty who are joint appointed in, for instance, engineering, engineering education, and in other areas, which is again, good and bad. That's the focus that we are at right now. However, engineering is not taught K-6, no matter what you say. And um, we lost faculty in literacy and language to the point that we can hardly teach the required state courses now. We have, uh, when I walk out the door, the literacy and language faculty will be uh, four people. And two of those people teach second language learning. So you have over 12 hours that have to be covered um, by two people, and that's almost impossible to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the media science program. Oh, the media yeah. science program. With Carolyn White. Carolyn White Nick, was uh, absolutely. She was there when you came. I'm sure. She was. I, the woman who was the head of the library school at Madison had asked me to stay on and do a PhD, and when she figured out I wasn't going to do it, and because my husband was going here, she said, I know Carolyn Whitenick, and I will get in touch with her. And so she set up a meeting for me with Carolyn, and Carolyn hired me part-time at first. And Carolyn ran a wonderful program, and Katie, you were involved, I think, in the summer parts right. of that program. Right. She uh, actually strove to bring in people of diversity. She brought in a lot of young African-American librarians or would-be librarians from two of one of them still one of my dearest friends from Jackson Mississippi and from other areas around that uh, kind of area and she brought them in to train them and get them a master's degree and she got them scholarships and she ran summer programs and I think in the summer program she could sort of figure out who she wanted yeah, to stay Trying to think, not the was it for the whole summer. Or My, I think it was at least eight weeks. Yeah, something yeah. like that, as yeah. I recall. Yeah, yeah. and uh, she utilized. Uh, I I got involved in it because she knew Keith Dowden. Yeah, and then Keith is the one that uh, had me go and talk with her, and then we just got to be. I, I like Carolyn. Yeah, really she was wonderful. Yeah. But you always knew where Carolyn stood. Never, and she trained me better than anyone else how to be a good human being. She could bark at you one moment, and the next moment she forgot it. <laughs> she, she wasn't angry at you. So she arranged for my class to go on 
television. It was going to be on local television, and it was. And so I was filmed. Um, every single session was filmed. And when I started the filming, um, I was pregnant, but I didn't tell Carolyn right away. And I went in because I knew I was going to get to be a big mom, and I wouldn't be as good on TV. And so I went in and said, Carolyn, I'm going to have to take a couple weeks off sometime. And she said, why? And then I said, well, I'm going to have a baby. And she said to me, you're just a baby machine. And I said, why, that's not fair, Carolyn. I've only had one other, and we didn't plan this baby. And she said, you can't even plan. <laughs> but she forgave me instantly. We went to the next meeting with all the guys from the communications department that, was do that were doing the filming, and the director was going to take a couple of weeks off to get married, and he announced that. And so I said, well, actually, I'm going to have to take a couple weeks off, too. And the man who was in charge of communications at that time turned to me and said, well, you can take the same weeks as John. And I said, it won't work that way. I'm going to have a baby. So Carolyn got this funny look on her face and smiled because she had said, I just wonder what all those men will say. And they didn't say a word. And I did take my weeks, and John <laughs> took his weeks. But uh -huh. so, um, so working with Carolyn, I really, if I were in the office, if I was in the office, and they called up and said somebody needed to go to the president's council meeting. She looked out, and whoever was in the office got to go. So I got to go to a lot of things all over campus. And she actually introduced me to the Children's Literature Association. Um, she, I'm sure she had, was helping me get involved in the Indiana Library Association because sure. I was really involved in that for a while. And she was really my mentor in many ways. And she, uh, her people... The students got placed. Oh, yes, they all got placed. And she was jobs. known throughout the state. Oh, and even right. more, because right. these young women and young men who came from the South went back to the South. And one of them uh, went back to the college in Jackson, Mississippi, the African American college uh, there. And another one was a young man who came from Tuskegee, and he went back to Tuskegee. So she, she purposefully picked people that she felt really wanted to be librarians and she got them placed. And they could make a contribution to right, the field. Right, right. And she got some kind of award at ALA when she retired. I don't know what it was. I should know. Um, I went with her and I um, actually roomed with her and then watched her get the award. But I know the American Library Association, especially school librarians, really appreciated Carolyn. Sure. And um, she always would say, that she had asked Fred Hogde if they couldn't have an MLA school here, that, that she thought they should have a school librarian MLA program so that these people would be known in other states. And she says that Fred Hogde said to her, Purdue doesn't need the okay of the American Library Association, so she couldn't go and ask for the certification for the program. <laughs> oh. uh, back fell. Uh, you were a fact, you and your husband? I was a fact fellow. Uh, my husband and I yeah. were both fact fellows. And well, he was talking just the other night about the time he took our oldest daughter, who was probably 10 or 11 at the time, to the talent show. And she was going to be one of the judges with him. And he was saying to someone, and I never thought those college students would be telling dirty jokes or singing body songs, but there they were, and my daughter was sitting right beside me. Uh, we judged Halloween costumes sure, right. and all kinds of things. It was fun. Yeah. Um, talk about family. Now, your husband is also on the faculty. Um, in yes. Hi in history. Yes. And that, uh, we, I started part-time, and um, I think John Stover was the uh, scheduled deputy in his department, and I think probably Carolyn was my scheduled deputy. But it was really nice. They would always make sure that we weren't teaching at the same hour so that we could shift kids back and forth. Did you have had, you had both of your children at that time? or just I, had, I was pregnant with Heather, my oldest daughter, when I first started working for Carolyn part-time. And then uh, Beth is four years younger. By then, I was, uh, I was still part-time when, when Beth was born. Um, and, and we moved to this side of town from Lafayette um, when Beth was probably, well, she was a baby. So we moved here um, before, after Bob had tenure, but before I had tenure. Um, and I became half-time permanent staff, and I had classes of 100. And um, they made me 
full-time permanent staff when I went in because I had a possibility for a job in the library school at Indiana University and so Bob was able, Bob King was able to change me. But he said, you know, you'll have to go up for tenure early. And I said, well, my husband's already an associate with tenure, so I don't think it's early. Um, but, uh, and then I went up for tenure. And, um, well, tell about your family. Did your children go to Purdue? Our children did not go to Purdue. Okay. Our um, oldest daughter went to Grinnell. Her grandfather called it Granola. And she was, well, actually, she started at Northeast Missouri State with a full ride. They found her from her ACT scores, and they offered her the Dean's Scholarship, and she went there for a year and then transferred to Grinnell. And she had been a Russian Studies major at, at Northeast Missouri, and she went to Grinnell because they had a good Russian Studies program, but then she said, I don't want to be a Russian Studies major because I'll just be a translator, and because I'm a woman. So she became a theater major. And she is now an assistant professor um, at Auburn University, and she directs more than anything else, but she's also in charge of the stage management program. And so she's still in theater, and she's uh, continued in theater. Uh, my other daughter, Beth, so she went, Heather went away probably because she needed to leave West Lafayette. West Lafayette is highly competitive for the kids in the high school. And they both went to West Lafayette. Yes, they both did. And, and Heather was anorexic, and she later went to visit one of her best friends in, in Spain, and one of her classmates stayed with one of her classmates from high school. And this classmate and she began counting up the numbers of kids, girls, who were anorexic in their class. And it was amazing how many they each knew. It, uh, it's over-competitive. It's um, very strange high school. Very good. Excellent school, but for a small school, it, I suppose Robert Cormier's The Chocolate War rang true to me because I know what small schools can do. They can pressure. Our older, our younger daughter always watched our older daughter, and whatever she did, she sort of did in a different way. So she went through high school in three years, and she had been going to music school in the summer since she was 11 uh, on the East Coast, and that's she started there because of a sabbatical we were on. And um, she knew she wanted to be a music major. So she claimed she would love to have gone to Purdue, but Purdue is not allowed to have a music program. So, um, and she's into music composition. She is, I think, an assistant professor, but she might be an associate professor uh, at, in the community college system in San Antonio, Texas now. And she teaches music composition and American studies. And, um, but she, she went, likes it. Oh yeah, she likes it. She, she, the community college I've learned a lot about by watching Beth. Um, the community college where she is, most of the people have PhDs. That it's also not at all what you think of as a community college. It's a two year prep school that gets them ready to go to college. Um, somewhere else. So all of her classes are like the freshman and sophomore music theory classes, music uh, uh, training classes, and mu uh, music composition. And um, but she teaches five classes a week. You know that's the community college, and mm -hmm. she's done a lot of other interesting things. And she likes San Antonio as a town. She's in the composers forum in the town, so she's still composing and still having her pieces played. And uh, she's, she's our child who always was doing something for others. So when she was at the University of Illinois as an undergraduate, she worked in one of the homeless shelters every weekend and did the lockdown and cooked for the women and their children. And um, when she was at Yale, I don't know that she did anything to help others, but that was when she decided to go into the Peace Corps in Africa. And she went to Africa for two years in the Peace Corps came back here, met her sister at uh, Indiana University where her sister was getting the PhD and her sister was married, met the man she would marry, and then went to Texas, San Antonio, and um, did her PhD, her Doctor of Music, at the same time she was teaching full time, and drove back and forth between San Antonio and Austin, took one year off because she had a research assistantship and a fellowship, and went to Austin uh, and lived there with her husband, but 
she still commuted and taught because her husband has health problems and she would have lost her health insurance. And so she commuted back and forth and taught and has stayed there ever since. So she's taught me a lot about the fact that community colleges aren't just where the dead beats go, yeah, you know. They've got a lot, and they've grown a lot, too. Yeah. Awards and honors, any specific one you'd like to mention? Well, I suppose the, uh, the award that means the most to me is the Ann Devineau Jordan Award from the Children's Literature Association. I got it a couple years ago. It's for your lifetime work in the field of children's literature. And, um, yeah, I felt honored that my was colleagues... Was it a surprise, or did you have a unique link? It was, it was a surprise, except... There's a young man who's a member of the Children's Literature Association, and he heard me speak years ago, Mike Cadden, and he heard me speak years ago, and he kind of became a groupie, you know, a kid who I always talk to, and we almost <laughs> always go out to eat together. And One of my graduate students <coughs> here was one of his best friends, and so I saw him all the time. And he kept wanting me to run for the board again, or run for president or run for this or that and I kept saying Mike I've done all that I don't need so I remember at one of the parties it was a cocktail party um, he said to me Jill don't you want the Ann Jeve Devineau Jordan award and I went oh come on Mike and he said no wouldn't you like that so I swear he nominated me because I said to him I would never take it unless you were president or we were at Illinois State when I received it, because Illinois State is, I know a lot of the faculty there who are in children's lit, and I got it at Illinois State, and he was on the board, so I just think that he nominated <laughs> me. That's just my feeling. Uh, hobbies and special interests? I used to sew. I don't do that anymore. Um, I like to read. Um, seems like an easy thing for me to do. My sure. husband and I play tennis in the summer on open courts. We don't play the game. We play a game called how long can we keep the ball up <laughs> instead of how soon can we make the other person miss. And um, so I do that. I like to cook. I, I really like to cook. That's good. We'll keep that in mind. Now, that you've given some papers to the Virginia Kelly Carnes. That's very nice. Well, yeah. thank you. Very, very it, nice. it was nice for me. I didn't have to, you know, when Bob retires, unless he gives his collection, which I hope he would, uh, he's going to have to sort through what means something to him. And what I told the archives is, I'm giving you everything. You can throw whatever you want. And I'm even giving them, I've given them books and I will give them more because I'm cleaning out my office now. If I've highlighted and underlined them or used them a lot of times in class because uh, I gave them, I think, two or three copies of Northrop Prize, The Educated Imagination, because I used it to teach. And if you look through it, it doesn't always say the same thing. So it shows the difference in different times, how you as a scholar change. You know, you read something new. You think differently. Something has hit you. So it shows the experience of scholarship changes the way you think. And I'm honored and pleased that they would take my things. Uh, the reason I wish Bob would do it is I don't know how many husbands and wives we will, I will have worked almost 40 years here. He will have worked because he's on the five-year plan now. He will have worked more than 40 years when he's done. How many husbands and wives does Purdue have? And um, I think in many ways I have a very, uh, and he does too, I have a very rich uh, experience from Purdue. Um, to have gone from a school that was once a department, from a program in librarianship that was dissolved, and to have been able to stay at Purdue and to teach children's literature and to have my department head tell me I had to have a national and international reputation. Well, when you've done everything in libraries and your professional groups are library groups, that's why Carolyn did me such a favor by introducing me to the Children's Literature Association. Then I could change to the National Council of Teachers of Education and to the groups that came out of the Modern Language Association so that my focus changed. So I think Purdue shaped my career in interesting ways, and and um, and it is it, yes, and it is because I was here, and as the moments went by, different things happened. All right, sounds good. Um, Purdue tradition? Do you have a tradition of Purdue? Well, we really don't, but I'll tell you a funny story. Okay. Uh, we used we we do watch a lot of basketball, and actually, that daughter who is in uh, Auburn has the Big Ten circuit, so she can watch Purdue basketball. And the other night, she said to me on the phone that a friend of hers, Greg, that she, a young man she met later in life, uh, but 
he had graduated from Purdue. He had a PhD from Purdue in one of the sciences. And he actually played with the symphony when he was here. Um, she had given him a bear, she said. And she said, I don't remember this bear, Mom, but he says it's all dressed in Purdue clothes and it has a Purdue pen and a little bow tie. And I said, that's your John, that's your Katie bear. We, Ma, Grandma and I made you one and Beth one. We got brown bears and we dressed them in gold and black and gave them a little Purdue pen so that when we watched the games, they could hold the bear up and yell, yay, Purdue. <laughs> but those were their Jean Katie days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how about outstanding event? Um, yeah, more than one. I usually have to tell people they send character team one. Yeah, I, I've always liked um, Parents Weekend um, because uh, the College of Education holds an open house and um, I'm the advisor for the Purdue Student Education Association, have been for probably 10 years or so. And our kids go there and they put up um, a display and they eat the donuts and drink the coffee and talk. But they also honor all the kids who have won awards. And it's always fun to see the kids and see who's doing what. So that's a very important event to me. Um, and then I've always found that the Purdue events that were community-based, that went beyond just this campus, were really wonderful. There's a man named Rob Smith. He's in communications. And for years, he put together a program that was held off campus, and both Bob and I gave presentations at it, basically for the community. Another one of those programs that is here and doesn't go off, but is Books and Coffee. And it draws the community into the place. Um, I, when I first came here, I wasn't working, and there was a tutoring program from Purdue. And I tutored a young girl who lived on, on the wrong side of the tracks in Lafayette, she had no one in her family who had made it through high school, and I tutored her for a year and watched her grades come up, brought her over to Purdue. We were walking in the underground tunnel between the Union and the parking lot, and I said to her, the street is right over us. I didn't realize I'd scare her half to death. <laughs> and I asked How her. How old was she? Oh, right. she's like grade nine school. or ten. Okay, yeah. Grade school. And I asked her if she'd ever want to go to college or a place like Purdue. And she basically said she'd be lucky if she made it through high school. So I taught her how to use, you know, the yellow pages and things that would really, but it was fun to watch her grades. And that was something that Purdue did to help someone beyond the campus. And so I've always liked those programs, those kinds of things. Yeah, that's nice. Um, children's literature and academe and everyday literature. Well, comments. you know, children's literature and academe is an interesting thing. When I came here, I came from a library school, and I did believe the right books for the right child at the right time. And Carolyn brought me into a program that was like that. But Carolyn's program also was a service program that taught all the children's literature to all the elementary teachers to be. So I got into pre-teaching uh, uh, of the teachers. And um, looking at children's literature from my colleagues' point of view, Oftentimes, I see that what they're looking for is a book that will teach a concept. So they're looking for um, the didactics of literature, the teaching elements of literature. And nowadays, our kids look for the morals of children's literature, the way it, it will shape you into a good person. Um, and then once I became a member of the Children's Literature Association, and Popular Culture Association and the American Folklore Association, I realized that literature also had an aesthetic value that goes back to that librarianship. That is, finding the right book for you at that particular moment, seeing what is beautiful and pleasurable and, and wonderful for you. So really, in academia, there are people looking at children's literature in very diverse ways. And then, if you get out in the community, um, there are people in the public libraries who are doing exactly what we teach them to do here but in, and in the schools. But in addition to that, there are parents and there are caregivers and there are grandparents who also are seeking to find the right books. Sometimes going to a bookstore is an interesting thing to do because a child might pick the book they think they want, but the adult won't buy that book for them. They'll buy something else that appeals to them instead of what the child wants. So. 
I think that it's extremely important that what academics have to say about children's literature somehow has to be told in a way that the popular audience can also understand it. Right. I think it has to have both audiences. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Anything I forgot to ask? No, okay. you ask it all. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. It was Thank great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that.